Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm Sandy, and I'm, I lead the team at Sangamo, and I, I want to talk to you about what it is we do. But I want to, have, to do this as a more general talk and talk a little about gene editing and genome editing and what it means and the implications for us and for society. So it's going to be a more general talk rather than the usual corporate pitch. This is the first time we've tried it, so it's being tested on you, so thank you very much. Um, I'm a physician. I trained for seven years as a molecular biologist, and my wife said it would never be any use to me. And then this job came up, and, and it's given us uh, great fun over the, the subsequent two years to show that I was right for once. <laughs> and then I, I, and I worked for GSK for a long time, and then Takeda in Deerfield for three years, and I lived around the corner in State and Grand. And I know this is a typical spring day in, in Chicago, and it's the only spring day in Chicago, isn't it? <laughs> yeah? So, so we always have to, we're a public company, so we have to show our, refer you all to our SEC filings. So this is what I'm going to talk to you about. I'm going to talk to you a little about what gene and genome editing is, about our zinc finger technology, and why, it's, why we think it's the best. And I've already had a challenge from someone in the audience that we have to show it's the best. And the medicines that we're going to make and how we think about them and how you should think about them. Because uh, when I did this molecular biology a long time ago, in 91 to 97, uh, we were right at the forefront of it. We were um, sequencing base by base and none of us dreamt that we'd be in a situation just 15, 20 years later where we would take that knowledge and apply it to make medicines and potentially to cure disease. And that's a bit that's a fundamental change. This isn't another drug. It isn't even a slightly better way to do something. This will fundamentally change how medicine is given and how patients are thought of and how we treat disease. And that's a bit that makes this exciting. And that's why people like you here in, in this incubator that I'm told is the future of healthcare need to think about this and prepare for this as, as the future environment. So, I'm also going to show you some of the patients that we bring in to talk with us, and we feel this is really important. We bring the patients in for a couple of reasons. One is, uh, and it's both about responsibility. So the first responsibility is for the people that work with me to understand the responsibility they have to this patient. That when we do something or give something to a patient like Erica, we have a responsibility to get it right. This is something where when we do something to a patient like Erica, give her a new gene therapy or gene editing, that will last her for life. And therefore, we need to be absolutely sure that what we're doing is right. But then there's a second responsibility that's around urgency. Because these patients are waiting, and we have to have an urgency to get there and to get there with the medicine. And Erica's fascinating. Erica's 35. And she was diagnosed with MPS1 just when she was 21, which is incredibly unusual. But rare diseases are rare, so doctors have rarely seen them. And so often these patients are misdiagnosed. But even in the, in the time from 21 to 35, she's had 70 operations on everything from her, from her joints to her nerves to her heart. And the burden of disease is enormous. And her disease is, is really important to her. And the reason I like Erica is she has a tattoo showing the chromosome where the mutation is for her MPS1 disease. And, and it's that combination of the human condition and the human challenge and hard science that I think defines what Sangamo is and what we're going to be in the future. But she said something else that's also important. MPS is three letters. And she's not three letters. She's Erica. And we need to understand that each one of these patients is different and needs to be treated differently. They're not just a number on a chromosome. And they're not just three letters of a syndrome. They're a patient that each has a different desire and a different way they think of their disease. And we'll come back to that later on. But first, some of you might not be molecular biologists or have, have done this since biology at school. And so just to kind of remind us all of the picture, the human genome is 3.2 billion bases, which sounds like a lot. But the working memory on my iPhone is bigger. And my iPhone can probably contain 20 human genomes. So what was a huge number in the past is now a manageable number in the world of big data. It's, it's a tractable problem. When I did my PhD, 
I sequenced 15,000 bases over three years. Nowadays, we can sequence a human genome in an afternoon, and it costs perhaps down to $100. And the cost and, and, and the cost of the human genome isn't the sequencing, it's now what do you do with it, and the people that have to counsel the patient and understand what to do with it. So it's no longer about the biology, it's about the consequences of the biology. There are 20,000 genes within the human genome. So the whole beauty of humanity is controlled by just 20,000 different genes. So it's not just the gene themselves, but it's how it's expressed, how it's controlled, that defines why I look different from you. So we have very similar genes, but, and they're probably 99% similar, but we're different, and that's the beauty of this and the care that needs to be taken around the, the genome. And we're going to talk about gene editing or genome editing and gene therapy, and it's, it's a, an important difference. What we like to do and eventually want to do definitively is gene or genome editing, where we actually change the DNA. We either delete a bit of it or replace it with another piece of DNA. The current therapy that most people use is gene therapy. And in gene therapy, instead of changing your own DNA, we add an extra little bit of DNA. That it's called episomal, so it doesn't integrate. And as the cells divide, as your livers divide, and particularly we, we each change our liver every probably seven years, you kick out the, the episomal gene therapy. So it's not permanent. And that's why we like genome editing, because many of the diseases that we're studying start in childhood. And if you imagine the size of a, of a baby's liver and an adult's liver and the number of years and liver regenerations that they have to go through, the only solution for children is to get to them as early as possible and to do gene or genome editing. And what we do, as I say, is we use zinc fingers and we, we cartoon it with the, the scissors to either make a cut in the, genome, in the gene on the right to remove a bit of DNA, or we make a cut and we replace it with a new bit of DNA. It sounds sci-fi, but it actually works reliably. It's, it's more like engineering than it is biology. And the understanding we have over the many years means that we can reliably do this in the test tube. And the main question that we're facing isn't, will the DNA cut? It's, can I get enough of the zinc fingers in there to make the cut? Because if I do get enough in, in a cell or in an animal, it works every time. It's not a question of can it work, should it work? It just works. It's what zinc fingers do when they meet a piece of DNA. It's just a matter of delivery, and I'm gonna come back to that later. There are other ways to edit DNA. And these are the crystal structures with zinc fingers, which is our technology, meganucleases, talons, which is another technology that Sangamo developed. And then I believe there's a thing called CRISPR. <laughs> now, God bless them. They have changed the field. Anyone can do CRISPR. It's very easy to do in a test tube. And if I was back doing my PhD and wanted to do a simple experiment in a, in a cell or even in a mouse, I probably would use CRISPR because for most things, it suffices. But our belief is it's good for experiments. It hasn't yet got to the stage where it's good to, to make a medicine. Sangamo with the zinc fingers have done, have had five, six, seven almost things in patients. The three CRISPR companies haven't yet got anything into a patient. So there's still time to go. I hope they get there because I believe that eventually the solution is to have a variety of different techniques or technologies that will be applied appropriately to a different disease or a different patient. So they will get there and um, we wish them well. And when they get there, I want to try and set up a framework of how you think about editing because it's a complicated thing and, and we're all very competitive and we all say ours is best. And the way we're trying to frame the discussion is with precision, efficiency and specificity. And the ideal technology will manage all three of them and bring it all together. So precision is where can you target. So if you imagine this genome of, of 3.2 billion base pairs, how many of those base pairs can you recognize and make a cut? And with zinc fingers, there's nothing that constrains us. And so we can cut any nucleotide in the genome. And for about two thirds of them, we already have the appropriate zinc fingers in the cupboard. So it, the rest of them, we just need to make a bit like you make a bespoke suit for someone that's too tall or too wide. 
CRISPR is constrained by something called a PAM sequence, which means they can only cut, I know at the moment it's about 2 or 10% of the nucleotides. They will get there, but at the moment we win on precision. The next way is how well can you edit? So if you recognize a bit of DNA, how reliably in a test tube do you make the cut? And we regularly now come up to 90% efficiency, 99.5 in one legendary batch. And so we feel we can, we can efficiently make uh, cut at the right place. And then finally, it's around specificity. So once you've recognized the bit of DNA, once you've made the cut, do you cut anywhere else? Now, as a physician, that's important. You want to make sure when, that when you make this edit in a patient that it only happens in one place. You don't want it to be off target. Because although the side effects you might get from your aspirin or your antihypertensive medicine are important, they go away the next day. The moment the drug drains from your system and you pee it out or absorb it in, or digest it in your liver, you're safe. You don't have the drug in your system. What we're doing will be with you for life. And therefore, it's very important that we understand it only cuts one place and doesn't cut anywhere else. And of course, we believe that CFNs are the only technology at the moment that can do all three. The more you change specificity, the less effective you become for many of the other technologies. The more you change the specificity, often you constrain the, the uh, precision. So the three pull each other in different directions. And over the 20 years, we've engineered our technology so as all three come together. So this is a zinc finger. So zinc fingers are present in all of you. They're, they are how we control the expression of our genes normally. They circulate in your body and they turn genes on and off. They wreck it, they're what are called alpha helices. So you can imagine the helix that looks like a helter-skelter. Each helix recognizes three nucleotides within the genome. They're joined to the next one by a linker and a beta-pleated sheet. And a beta-pleated sheet is just a fancy name for a folded bit of protein. And we store them as two zinc fingers at a time. So it's two zinc fingers, each recognizes three nucleotides out of 3.2 billion. And there's a subtlety about this that I want, I want to try and show in this slide. And we're testing this slide, so I hope, hope I can explain it well. So if you look at the one on the, light, the left, the sequence is GTA, CTA, G. And the zinc fingers ends up with zinc, uh, the, the two zinc fingers recognize it. And the code below is what the zinc fingers are called in our library. If you move the zinc fingers just one to the right, you can see that the zinc finger themselves are completely different. So but just by moving one nucleotide, it doesn't mean they're one nucleotide different. They are completely different zinc fingers. And McDavid, who, who um, is, is our communications expert, tries to tell me these are homonyms. So like the word whole and the word holes just moves one along, but has a completely different definition. And, and so we think of it as, as a way of, just by moving one either way, we get a whole new sense of efficiency and specificity to, to the zinc finger. So when you send me a sequence of the gene that you want edited, we clunk together like Lego. We push them together like Lego. And within eight to 10 days, we can come up with a zinc, I call them a zinc hand which is usually about um, six, six zinc fingers long. And we use a couple of them to make a cut. So six, that's 18 plus 18 is 36 base pairs, which means it's a unique sequence in the genome. 30, a, a, a string of 36 nucleotides only happens once in the genome. So immediately we get a specificity that is not available to the competition. And then it sticks to the DNA. Now, on the left here, you can see a zinc finger binding into the DNA. And what we discovered was the zinc finger was binding non-specifically. And, and you see the positive charges. Some amino acids are, are charged and others are neutral. And we discovered that there were positive charged ones on the arginine on the left-hand side. And they were sticking non-specifically to the, to the DNA. And when we got rid of that, the non-specific binding and the off-target completely disappeared from our zinc finger. And this is stuff we're going to publish this year.